Hey guys, welcome to That Pedal Show. Dan here. Mick here, hello. So we are in Connecticut. We've just arrived at Analog Man's, uh, I don't know, it's like an evil genius lair. Um, I've been here before. This is the first time for Mick. There are amazing things everywhere. It's the most extraordinary place. So I was really excited to do this because um, I wanted to show you guys this for ages. We've finally been able to tee it up with Mike. Um, so and we managed to find a stairwell to stand in. <laughs> so let's, <laughs> let's, let's, uh, go in. let's go in. Let's go in. Hello. Hello. Dude! Daniel! How are you doing, man? Good to see you again. Mick? So, the man in the flesh, analog man. Analog Mike, Mike here. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Very good. Okay, so I mean, we haven't even got out of the doorway yet, <laughs> and uh, we look at this. Well, some old tube screamers from random people, oh, Scott Henderson, Kenny Wayne Shepherd, and some old pedals. The um, Rick Danko busted this old 808 and stepped on it, and Jim Weeder re rebuilt it. And uh, yeah, some uh, Kenny Wayne Shepherds and trays, Scott Henderson pedals. Okay, and things down there. <laughs> Here we, here we go, here we go. Uh, to our uh, first room. Oh man. <laughs> this is some okay. of our um, vintage stuff in the showcases. We've got um, American stuff over here, MXR, Mutron, Ross, Maestro, Tyco. Original Maestro, Bass Brassmaster. <laughs> you like the brass master. Oh I man. That's... I just was watching a Chris Squire rig rundown and he had a really beat one of those. You couldn't even tell what it was, but he was using it up till the end. Rest in peace. Blender, blender. <laughs> oh, look at you. Blending. I have one of these. Um, <laughs> it's really interesting. There's a couple different versions. That's the normal four knob version. Right. Yeah, that's the way I had. Meat in the box. Oh, that's so good. So good. It's gonna be a long day. It's gonna be the most awesome day. I've known you since I oh, first contacted you in 2004. This was um, a, a quick story. I was just started the company then, the gig rig, and I had no idea what I was doing. And I had some questions, and I thought because I'd I'd been a fan of your stuff since the mid 90s oh. when. Uh, a band I saw in Sydney had a couple of your fuzz pedals and I just thought that sounds awesome and so I became a fan and then anyway started the company 2004 and I had a couple of issues I thought I've got no idea who I can contact to ask about this I thought I'll send an email off to Analog Man the, you know the, the worst that can happen is he would just delete the email and <laughs> tell everyone I think I've got a stalker beware of this guy <laughs> But then you reply the next day, and it was, it was so cool. So, um, you know, it just gives you a little bit of a the person we're dealing with. Beautiful human. Um, but so, when did you start the, the Analog Man brand? Your first out of shipping pedals. When was that? Well, the um, we start. I started doing this full time in two thousand. But um, as you know, in the mid nineties, I was uh, building a lot of pedals myself, mm. um, doing modifications. Um, doing a lot of guitar shows and we started off as Analog Man vintage guitar effects. Right. I would sell, buy and sell vintage pedals, um, go to the big pedal shows. Back then before the internet, the, um, the sh guitar shows were just fantastic. Mm. That was the place you would go and see all the great guitars and buy mm. and sell things. Um, it's, it's gotten a lot weaker now, but that, that's how we started is, is vintage guitar effects. Right, okay. And then in 2000, you opened up here? Yes. Um, I quit my day job because I was, you know, keeping pretty busy at night building pedals and modifying pedals. So I opened the shop, um, went full time with just myself and uh, started doing the modifications and um, a few pedals like the Ross compressors, right. things like that, the compressor. And then we just kind of grew from there and took, took over half of this building <laughs> slowly. Okay, so if we can rewind a bit, I, 
I want to find out because you were an engineer, and where was the where did you go? I actually, I can make a better fuzz. Yeah, the thing was um, when I started in the vintage guitars. Uh, it was just really getting big in this country, mm. and especially in Japan, they had all the money in uh, in the 80s. So the, the American guitar dealers, like Gruen's Guitars, they would send their stock lists to Japan before they even released them here or really? put them in magazines. And the Japanese dealers would pretty much buy almost everything they had. Wow. So I kind of started doing the same thing. I was working in Japan. I would bring guitars there and sell them. And then it started catching on in this country. The vintage guitar magazine came out, and people started realizing how valuable these were, and they started to get a lot of people hunting down the guitars. So it got really hard to find. So I started finding the pedals. Um, and then the pedals started catching on too. There was a lot of articles and like guitar player had a guitar effects issue mm -hmm. and it started getting big. And uh, when I could no longer find the pedals, I real, you know, I was buying and selling them and fixing them and le learning how they worked. And I realized, you know, why don't I just build these things rather than trying to find them? Mm. And uh, that's kind of how it started. I've already, I've been in here two minutes and I've already just destroyed something. So, um, An irreplaceable gonna, vintage pedal, I'm, but that's yeah, okay. Yeah, it's okay, it's okay. I'm going to put that back there and then walk away, walk away. Um, yeah, we wow. do have some British stuff, some, oh, some tone benders in there. All the Mutrons, I think all the Mutrons are down there, including oh, yeah, a rare so, purple biphase. Okay, that's, sorry, I need to just pull something out for a second. I've never seen one of these in the flesh. Thanks for showing us around, Mike. <laughs> no problem. Dan's just in all the cupboards. Oh my god, <laughs> look at that! Dude. I'm gonna stand up and run away. Look at this thing. Oh man. I don't know how many of those they made, but... So what cool. is that then? Come on, give us an era and a name. This was from the mid-70s and they used an Italian Pirelli rubber pad on these that you would find in stairwells in schools and industrial buildings, but it works. <laughs> That's so cool. That is so cool. That's Pirelli. I don't have my glasses yes, on. Yes, that's Pirelli. Oh, man. P0. Oh, just, it's just too good. It's too good. Okay. I see our Japanese cupboard. <laughs> this one's got some vintage Japanese pedals oh, yeah. in it. Oh, yeah. Oh, some more rubbish in there, look. Blimey. <laughs> the 808's seen better days, but it probably sounds great. Oh boy. boy. Okay, right. And then we've got more British and American things, some larger effects over here. Electroharmonics. A lot of electroharmonics actually. Uh, mitten the Box Univibe. Uh, mitten the Box Range Master, which is very rare. An original Gizmotron. Yes, and like most Gizmotrons, it's completely broken. All the, all the little feet break off of them. Right. <gasps> oh man. And some vintage analog man pedals. <laughs> oh, it's so cool. And it's so cool. The old um, bag, the custom bag, as used by Jeff Beck. Have you seen this? No. This is okay. This is. Nuts. Oh, so this, is, this is the custom bag and you would strap it around your back with a uh, thing and then it has a bypass switch on it to send the signal to, to this speaker or to your amp speaker and then you'd have a tube going up into your mouth and uh, Jeff Beck seemed to like his. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember seeing the show that uh, Jeff Beck was doing a demo of it. Yes, on YouTube you yeah, can yeah, see yeah, it. It's yeah. very it's funny. Amazing. Very so what, funny. someone said, you know, the bagpipes are a cool thing, let's make that into a guitar <laughs> The old paper. Oh, it's just it's too much. It's like in every corner is just something that's like, hang on, just let me just play. This is crazy. Oh, and this is what everybody gets, gets <laughs> mad at is my, my fuzz face the, the, pile. The, the sheer irreverence of the... People um, don't like how I treat my fuzz faces, so they, I just keep piling them up. <laughs> okay. What can I ask you of all this lot? What's your favorite? All of the old fuzz faces I have, I would say about 80% um, of them don't work at all, and the 20% that work, none of them really sound that good. Right. And so I'm just keeping them for now. Eventually, I'll you know tune them up. Okay. But I get these on trade and collected these over the past 20 years. And 
None of them really sound too good. <laughs> so what, what goes? The resistors drift, the capacitors? Yeah, it, pretty much everything drifts. Right. Mostly the, the transistors will die, but yeah, okay. the resistors drift a lot. Right. The capacitors get dry. And... We're going to get into this, all right? <laughs> We're going to get into the whole fuzz thing because it's a, it's a fascinating subject and there are probably no one else on the planet who knows more about dialing in the perfect fuzz tone than Mike. So yeah, that's, that's a big subject. So, so the L stuff is loads of fun, but really want to check out how the pedals are made here and uh, you know the whole process. So uh, could we have a look in the- Sure, we have a back room where we have most of our production, although we do modifications in some production in this room. We have a, a second room that we've rented out. Go to the secret back room. I know doing some drilling out some King of Tone cases over here. Ah, wicked. Right. No box tape way. Echo. Yeah, of course it doesn't work, but maybe uh, the guys at Sound Sound Gas. <laughs> this is right off. I'm sure they. I'm sure they. <laughs> oh, that's crazy. That's a very interesting little. Yep, sort of like an AC30. And we got Justin building up some King of Tone pedals over here, popping yep. some boards into cases. There it is. That's awesome. Chances are you've never seen as many King of Tones <laughs> in one place before. <laughs> Genuinely excited about this. Um, because my beloved Mutron has developed a quirk, shall we say, and I'm on the hunt. So I'm going to play this uh, in a bit and... Uh, I'm seeing some. It's, it's just, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Look at that. All old parts. Mm. There's a conversation that we need to have about old parts because we had this last time I was here. Mike and I had the most fascinating conversation about this stuff, about how every little bit matters about this thing, about you know why Mike spends so much time hunting down these old parts and even old capacitors and things. And it's uh, just think, Dan, with a brilliant bit of editing, we could probably cut to that right now. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that I've found fascinating is so you know we are sat in front of your parts storage area and the meticulous detail with that goes into the pedals is also apparent with the way that you source the components um, now a lot of engineers would argue a capacitor is a capacitor a resistor is a resistor it doesn't make any difference but that's not the way things are done here so at what point did you did you realize? So you you started building your own fuzz faces. When did you say only this very particular component will do? Well, well things have really changed a lot in the, uh, in the guitar effects um, industry. When I started out, everyone was really interested in finding the exact tones, these subtle differences mm. in in the pedals. Um, which is, you know, I started modifying TS9s before the reissue even came out into TS808s and, and finding the perfect fuzz face. And everyone was really interested in these details and allowing your exact guitar tone to come through, mm -hmm. which is one thing all of our pedals, I, it, you know, if you don't like your guitar tone, you don't like your amp tone, don't buy our pedals because it's not going to change it. Yeah, yeah. I want to preserve those things. Um, nowadays, it's more about, you know, the, the, the look of the pedal and, and the marketing and things like that, which I don't really care about that much. But I've always been into the the fine details and like working with a guy like Jim Weeder, these guys who've been playing the same guitar and the same amp mm. for 50 years and at that level, 
their ears are different from, well, you know, you're an excellent player too, but they're different from the normal person. They can hear things that norm, other people can't hear. Sure. And he'll plug into a pedal that everyone likes, and in five seconds he'll say, I can't use that. Right. That's not, that's not my sound. Mm. And in order to get that preserved sound, um, like we had talked about before, everything matters. And um, Love that. the capacitors, you know, even if it's the same spec, there are, there are other differences. Um, resistors, some people say carbon copper resistors add noise. Well, the noise that they might add is 0.01% of what noise you get from the best op amp. So it really doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so all those things, we just, um, we just try to use the absolute best things we can get as long as we can get them. Mm. So Justin's your equivalent of one of those great big surface mount machines. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's as close to a robot as we get. It's Justin. That's right. Cranking them out, assembly line style. <laughs> it's funny, you know, because uh, like a lot of people, I guess, I spend quite a lot of time on the Analog Man website, and uh, you see all these things mentioned. So. Um, right. got transistors QSB 175, there. those are some old Japanese transistors from the 60s or 70s. So all this stuff just amassed. And I noticed that over here, just going to go, sorry, you have to excuse the shaky cam. Um, there we've got some BC 109s. That yes, those are all tested, put on a spreadsheet. And these are some Russian transistors we're using for the Sunbender Mark IV. These are tested and ready for sorting. And there's a bunch of other transistors, the CV7005s and BC183s and everything else all tested and ready to put in pedals that are built to order. Look, let's just spend a couple of minutes on this because I, this is fascinating. What is it about, you know, when you're designing a, a fuzz, you know, so why in particular these transistors and, and are, are you just find them at random and trying them out in, in circuits and seeing how they sound or these specific ideas you have in mind for a specific type of pedal? Some of these I've found randomly and tested and found that they were really good, but normally I'll look for the, the ones that were used in the vintage pedals. Right. And if, th if I can't find that exact one, I'll find out the military equivalent, which is like the CV series, the CV7005 is the military equivalent uh -huh. of, an, of an OC transistor. And then we'll, we'll get a bunch of those in and test them. but. The number on the transistor is not that meaningful because you actually have to test them and see what they are because a lot of them have either been changed or they're just, uh, they've are just they been picked over the last several decades. All the good ones have been picked out and the right. ones that are left are just junk. Right, wow. So the, both ways we use to uh, decide which transistors to use. And these are becoming scarce. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's still, people are coming out of the, the woodwork finding these things, mm. um, but they're, they're definitely going to run out eventually. Right. The current offerings of pedals that you got at the moment, the new envelope filter, which you played with yesterday, which yes. was awesome fun. And that's based around the, the MXR. MXR. Yeah, and that's a really weird circuit, the way it works. Um, it's very odd because it uses some, some chips that were never really designed for that purpose. But wow. the engineer who designed it did a, did a great job. And they're very hard to build because if you buy one of those chips, from, from the store and build that pedal, it probably won't work. There's a specific manufacturer of that chip and you have to use their chips or it doesn't work because the chips weren't really designed for that purpose. Right. So I don't think there's any other clones of that pedal around or wow, certainly awesome. not many. And I don't think MXR can even make them because I don't think they can source um, those chips. That's awesome. Oh, one of the things we were, um, I think in my last visit a couple of years ago, you had, was it an MXR pedal that MXR didn't even realize, remember, remember they'd made? Yeah, I have the, <laughs> the walk box, the talk box, and yeah, there's, there's quite a few things like that, that, you know, the company like that can, can build so many things and those people are gone and there's no records of them. <laughs> That's just classic. And I have I have an MXR um, workshop manual that shows the, the colors they need to use for their logo and wow. the styles of the logos for different things and all, all this really interesting stuff. That's amazing. Back in the day. You know, these are things that you've collected over decades. Yeah, and luckily I was able to buy most of the 
amazing gear you see at you know pennies on the dollar as to what they mm. sell for today mm. um so you know it was good to get an early start <laughs> and and you found a lot of these um like locally or because you, you're saying you spend a lot of time in japan mm -hmm. Um, can I ask what you were doing in Japan to start? Yeah, with? I was a software engineer in the uh, late eighties, mid late eighties over Working there. Working in Japan, and that's wow. how I actually learned about vintage guitars. Was I had spare time in Japan, so I would walk around Tokyo, and you go to um, like the Akihabara area or other areas where the the guitar stores back then were just unbelievable. Oh, As I said, man. Grun would sh pretty much ship all his inventory to Japan and I would go there and see, see them and smell them. The, just the smell of these guitar stores yep. was, was phenomenal. And then I saw what prices they were going for over there was just phenomenal and that's that's why I decided to, to sell guitars in Japan. Right, just, which led to the pedals and then, which, exactly, and so, exactly. and you were hunting for these vintage things and you were finding, but uh, interesting is that the, the pedals that you got out there, I mean they are, they're classics. Um, and it seems that you've got them before they became classics. It's like you just right. knew there was something about. Right. And so you're playing these things and listening to them going, okay, I'm going to gonna grab these or. Mm. Well, I'm a huge fan of, of classic rock and uh, pr Prague um, bl blues, psychedelic. And so these are the sounds I like. And right. that's kind of how I choose the pedals. All the pedals that we build you probably have seen them on my pedal board. I use them because those are the sounds I want. Mm. So, I mean, those are kind of in our DNA now. Mm. And the pedals I build, I try to try to get those sounds. Um, a lot of the new pedals that are out are coming out with you know interesting pedals, interesting sounds, and things, but um, not necessarily going for those classic sounds that were on all the records that we love. So that's kind of the difference between our pedals and and a lot of the new pedals. Not saying you can't use our pedal for, for new and unique sounds, but we're really trying to get those classic sounds. I've had your King of Tone, and it's been a mainstay on my board for, uh, I've, wow, is it 10 years? When did oh, that come like, out? Yeah, well, it came out in the early uh, 2000s, 2003, I think. And this is, um, so you developed this, like, was it was with Jim? Yeah. Yeah, because we um, we got a uh, Marshall Blues Breaker from a um, guy who was working at, at uh, Korg Marshall, Marshall Vox at the time. Right. And he said it sounded good, and it did sound good, but you knew it needed something. So we just kept messing around with it and uh, came up with some ideas, mm. sent my ideas to my partner in Japan, Obayashi-san. And he found some things that he likes because he's got an amazing ear for, for tuning capacitors especially. And he's, and then we just came up with one, and Jim, Jim liked it. And... Uh, we said, okay, let's start making them. It's, I mean, it's an amazing pedal. Um, and there's definitely something about, I mean, so all your pedals, that there's a, there's a characteristic that you can tell the, you know, we talk about it all, all the time, how much thought and care goes into the, the building process, but the same ethos goes in behind the design thing and sit, sitting down and playing it and listening to it and mm. real world applications, you know, um, which is, why so many you know pro players use your stuff because mm. they're using it and in the mix you know and it right. always just manages in to the band. in the band it sounds amazing uh, we were at mike's last night and uh mike has this amazing area in his house where the band comes in and plays and so mick and i were with you last night and I mean, it was so much fun. But this is kind of like where you're road testing things. You actually exactly. get the band in, exactly. you get the pedals in, you have schwang, <laughs> and you know, so you can and and you're you're testing these things live. That's the way to do it. Yeah, that is really the way to do it. Sometimes I'll have something in the shop that'll sound pretty good, but I'll get it out there and it's like I can't really hear it. Right. It just doesn't. It's not. It's not really working. Some people will get it and try it in their bedroom, and you know, the amp on too, and they'll send it back because it yep. doesn't sound good. And I agree, it probably won't sound good like that, but right. that's not what we designed the pedal for, unfortunately. Okay. <laughs>
So what I thought we'd do is we'll have a quick look at some of the classics, some of the new things that you've done before we go deep diving into fuzz, because that's... You can get very deep in fuzz, yeah. that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. You've already got pretty deep in the intro. Oh, man. It's, I mean, yeah, it, it's amazing. Right. Um, so let's start at the beginning of the chain. We have your new envelope filter. Yes. Now, what I like about this, with everything just set at 12 o'clock, Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, the, now we've got the, the threshold and the attack. The, the emphasis knob, so that's like a filter uh, range. Right. Less, more or less of the, the filtery sound. Down it mellows it. And that was something we added to the original MXR, um, along with the up-down, so you can get that neutron out sound right. in addition to the wah. We're right in the up position, and I'll go down after okay. a bit. Awesome, awesome. I, I just want to hear that with the, um, the printer tone for a second. Now, um, your compressor, you've uh, which has been out for, for years, and this is yes. the new take on it. Your, yes, the this is our Rev 5. After <laughs> four previous revs, we finally added the mix knob, right. and uh, um, I think it came out really good. The, the cool thing is if you turn the mix down all the way, you don't get any compression, and there should be no difference on or off when you're playing. your frequencies there and not change your tone at all so that's your basic sound and then you can add as much of the, the compression as, as you want the mix and you get your chicken picking Three o'clock is good. Get a little bit of the dry in there. Right. Ah, 
yeah, that's great. Um, and the mix knob is only for the Ross yes, side? Yes, it's only for the Ross side. And okay. I know the juicer side is one of one of your favorites. And oh, that man. just has the volume and the internal control for the, for the bias. And the juicer is just a beautiful sound. That, this, the attack on that is just so unique. It it's is. amazing. Um, okay. For anyone who doesn't understand, uh, you were talking about Juicer and you were talking about Ross. Yes, yeah, so the, the Ross uh, is the, it's the compressor that, it's like the grandfather of all of those style of compressors, isn't well, it? Well, the Dynacon came out first and the Ross was a slightly improved version. Right. And that got quite popular due to Trey Anastasio and a few others. Right. But it's very similar to a Dynacomp. Okay, right. And the orange squeezer, so that's that's the um, the Dan Armstrong uh, orange box and that would plug directly into the guitar. Yes, There's... and I'm sure you, you can see that in some of the video he did going through our vintage collection. You can see that one in the Ross too. We've got those in the collection, obviously. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Now, this is fascinating. Um, this the the, the Astrotone. Um, we'll have a quick look at this because it's uh, it's just it's really interesting. The the original Astrotone um, had this amazing enclosure, yeah. right? And uh, there but two the, two versions. There was they were both triangular. One had knobs that were kind of recessed, and the other one had knobs that stuck out the back. And right. they're both very cool looking. Right, but really rare. Yeah, really hard the to get hold. Was really rare. And it's a, it's a really interesting fuzz because it's not it's not crazy amounts of fuzz. No, but um, here we go. Beautiful. The thing I like about it is you can play chords through it, rhythm, everything mm. Everything comes out clear. And it's also great to stack if you want to get like a Gary Clark Jr. sound, like run it into a, like a Prince of Tone with the drive up and play some nasty, dirty blues lick. <laughs> It's better to stack in different orders too. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wonderful. Okay. Uh, yeah, Prince of Tone, we've obviously we've had this on the show uh, quite a bit. This is half? Half of the King of Tone. Half of the King of Tone. Right, with a couple of dip switches inside so you can get a little more mid mid lows. Uh, we improved the distortion. The distortion on this, this pedal actually sounds quite a bit better than the King of Tone distortion. <laughs> <laughs> Which is loud because it takes the clipping out of the circuit. Right. Wonderful, wonderful. Now, by chorus, obviously, um, viewers of the show will have seen this quite a lot. Um, I have it, it's my favorite chorus. It's the one that I use instead of the C1. Um, and what I love about it, it's you've got the two different controls um, that you can just switch between. So if we have um, just a nice, deep, uh, slow chorus. And then we switch to the faster rate. So cool! It's so cool. It's like this. It's almost got a um, the way it modulates. It's almost a, a uni vibe type thing. Would you get the the rate up really quick? Mm. That sort of rotating speaker, the pulsing thing, right? Yeah, awesome. yeah, it definitely sounds very close to a Leslie at the high speed. Yeah. Where do you, as far as your modulations are concerned, I'm just interested. Do you always have your chorus after your gain stages? Yes, I okay. do myself. All yes. right. Phases. 
Uh, yeah, I think my phaser... Phaser is kind of fun to put in front of the, the dirt mm. to get a more pronounced sound, but I have mine personally uh, last I just for a normal, more of a classic sound. Right, okay. Awesome. Again, we've had this on the show loads because it is my favorite sounding analog delay. It's just amazing. And with the, uh, the Amazio as well, right. that's a really interesting unit. Mm. Um, it's so unique. <laughs> you, yeah. So that is the modulation section. Yes. Um, so how does that how does that work? It's sending messages to the to the chip to alter to to alter the, the um, delay time. The delay time. Yeah. Right. Yeah, because the the analog delay is a hundred percent analog. There's no there's no digital chips in there. So the controller basically just sends a control voltage to the right. analog delay and you could plug an expression pedal into there to do a control voltage also and change the delay time with like a boss expression pedal. So the controller takes your taps and calculates the control voltage that would be for that tempo and then you can also of course have dotted eighths or quarters uh -huh. or uh, and then it also has the modulation which takes that delay time and just like moving the expression pedal up and down gently that's how it does the modulation is right. by changing the delay time and you can change the speed uh, the amount of modulation and also the type of modulation. We have one which is just a nice sine wave and we have one that's kind of random to sound kind of more natural. Right. Like a tape delay kind of with glitches in it. <laughs> so cool. And again, you've got this great, um, you know, AB thing. So you can have two different settings with the delay. Yeah, a lot of delays have, a, have an AB, but it only changes the delay time, which to me is kind of useless. I tried one of those years ago and if you go into a long delay for your solo, you want it to be louder usually too, and you want it, maybe you want to have more feedback. Mm. So we switched all three knobs, not just the, the delay time. Oh, so great. So if I have a nice long delay here. And then I switch to a quick one here. Oh man, <laughs> I'm, I've been fascinated with analog delays. I mean, we've got some really amazing digital stuff that's come out, but whenever I plug into a great sounding analog delay, there's something about it that's just, the, it's something about the frequency of the, of the guitar and the way it works with the analog delay. It's just right. Um, I mean, do you have, as far as analog delays are concerned, mm -hmm. is, is there a, is there a reason that, you know, with, especially with, let's say, with this, for example, is it, a, is it a frequency thing or is it is it more fundamental, just the difference well, the, between analog and digital? The thing, the thing about the analog delays is it's easy to make a dark analog delay by filtering off the mm -hmm, top, mm -hmm. but we try to make it as bright as you can up to that point where it starts getting too much noise, and that's the trick. Right. Um, if you filter out too much of the noise, it, it gets it too dark. A lot of people like the Deluxe Memory Man. I love them too. That one has a higher frequency. They let more of the noise through, mm -hmm. which adds to its its beauty, if you ask me. But some people just can't deal with a Deluxe Memory Man because it's just too much noise right. and hiss. Right. And if you listen, if you play like a low E string, it, you'll hear the hiss because it's so separate mm -hmm. from the frequencies. And some people just hear that and they think the pedal's broken. But that's, that's the way they are. Right, right. Awesome. Okay. Finally, um, let's have a quick look at this. This is your modded DS1. That's the Pro Mod with the mid-range knob option, which we added the uh, the mid-range. And if you put it at nine o'clock, it's just like a our stock Pro Mod um, it, with the stock frequency. Right. Okay. So this is the stock one. turn up the mid-range and get rid of that kind of scoop sound. You can play, I'll turn it up while you're playing and you can hear what it does. Scoop 
it back out again. That's a lot of fun. That's a pace. <laughs> <laughs> the, the DS1 gets a, I wouldn't say a, necessarily a short shrift, but the when I hear an original, uh, like a um, made in Japan, mm. you know, one of the original the ones, and, and, and a new one, they do sound quite different. They do. What's that down to? Uh, most of it is the chip they changed. Uh, they used a really good chip in the old days and it was discontinued. Um, so we started using a JRC chip in ours mm. years ago, and then Boss realized it really did sound better, and Boss started using our our JRC really? chip in the production ones, um, which they still do. Except now the orange ones that you get have a tiny little surface mount board, which we can't modify anymore. But the black ones, the 40th or 40th anniversary or some anniversary, right. those still use the full size boards, and we've got. Um, I bought like several hundred of those, so awesome. we have those in stock, so we can continue to modify those for a while. Wicked, wicked. Okay, let's go fuzzy. Oh, a little boosting. Oh, a little the, boosting okay. Action to see what the boosters do to this different, is right. different things. Okay, so this is the um, the bad Bob boost. Is this is it's got nothing? Is this Bob Burt? Is that no? This was um, Robbie Wallace from our. RGW Electronics. He came out with these back, I think, in the '90s, and um, it's it's a booster made off of uh, Jack Orman's Mini Booster. Right. It's a very nice little FET booster, which actually kind of uses similar to FETs for the to the juicer. Okay. Um, but without the compression, and it definitely gives you crunch and volume boost. Um, and we, we took over production from him either in the normal size box, which is like an MXR, or the or the mini box. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. Lots of low end. I want to hear that with, with a fuzz. <laughs> The fuzz. It adds some clarity awesome. or something somehow. I have a question. Was the uh, booster after or before the fuzz there? After. Yeah, yeah, it sounded like it's after. Yeah. Before it would probably cause a lot of mush. Yeah. And That's then the amazing. The boost is a different kind of a of a, of a booster where it um, focuses your frequencies. People call it a, it's a treble booster, but it uh, it's not just adding high end. It really is a nice focus. Um, I use mine in the high mode all the time mm -hmm. um, with my band, but um, we have the mids and. Low, lower settings too and that's a great in, into these amps it might sound a little thin but once we start adding a, a pedal or two to it or if these amps are up loud enough it should sound pretty good we haven't mentioned the amps yet we're oh, running right. we're running this um this the cleanest super reverb i've ever seen in my life it's amazing and uh the, the um little fender pro junior the little fender pro junior and that is going into the marshall cab so hang on let me just do a this is the this is the um, the super. Oh, that's just divine. And then the Pro Junior. And then both them together. Okay. So that's the clean tone. If we put the Beano on straight into the amps. High setting. Pummel them. <laughs>
So you're going to hear that in the mix. I mean, I don't care how dense that mix is. <laughs> that's going to be punching people in the face. I yeah. love it. Now, where is this in the signal chain? Uh, this should be before the Prince of Tone, which is where I like it. Because stacked together, they're just... That's my classic rock sound right there if you stack them up. A deli downstairs, so it's like the noisiest room in the world for for, for a tel for poor Telecaster, but <laughs> we'll deal with that. That's ace. That's ace. Um, awesome. Okay, Mick, let's explore some fuzz. fuzz that in. was a very quick look through some Analog Man classics and the couple of new things. But what we want to do now is Mick and I are going to go deep into fuzzes. In the video yesterday, we had your the, the bi chorus on, which is again one of my favorite pedals. And Mick and I have been through this thing with some digital um, modulation stuff. And I find like there's some really good digital delays and reverbs because they have that analog dry signal, and then you can mix that stuff on top. But when it comes to modulation, I've never found a digital modulation pedal that, you know, if I compare to an old phase 90 or your chorus pedal or something. So, you know, your name, Analog Man, you know, what is it about this analog process? Why does it work so well for us guitar players? Well, what, one reason I think is because uh, because of the, the history of the, the sounds that are in our head, the bands and the songs that we love mm. were, were pretty much all made with, with analog um, or maybe some really early, early digital things. Um, but for some reason, like you said, modulation, it, digital just does, it doesn't have the, the same feel. Um, it's got high end, which is nice, but sometimes it's a little too much. It's, it tends to be harsh, right? especially if you're running them into other things like a distorted amp or a, mm. a booster or something. Something about the, the digital sheen on, on some of the modulation effects just, just isn't great. Um, but digital is getting better all the time. Mm. Um, if you buy a digital pedal now, you know, it's probably pretty good, but you know, in two years it's, it's going to be obsolete. <laughs> if you buy an analog yes. pedal now, it's, it's going to maybe gonna go be, up in value yeah. or it's not going to be obsolete, that's yeah. for sure. <laughs> It's interesting, isn't it? Because they, the, the digital stuff is always trying to be as good as analog, and it'll get you know it'll get closer and closer and closer. But the analog stuff, is just awesome from day one, and will continue to be awesome for as long as you play it. You know, the I just found it really interesting, and again using those things in context, as we can you know we've done shows and we'll sit down. It's like, oh, you know, it's amazing. But then for some reason, when you get in that dense mix and what you want is uh, an electric mistress yeah. and then, you know, trying to find a digital replication of that, it can sound fine. Actually, you, you can A-B these things and they can sound fine. But for whatever reason, when you put them in that mix hmm. and you're playing them, it's like it, it really is chalk and cheese. Hmm. Is that what they say in, in the UK, the USA chalk and cheese? Night and day. Night and day. It's night and day. <laughs> but we're learning it from you from your from your show. <laughs> uh, yeah, so it's it's you know, it's fascinating. Um, okay, massive thank you. We've had the thank you best so much. time hanging out with you. It's just We had a great time been, too. Oh, My man. band loves it when I bring great guitarists over to play and you guys are so much fun. This is the part of my job that one of the few parts of my job that I really enjoy, so I'm so glad you guys made it here. Um, it's been look, it's been an honor. Just quickly, um, what's new in the pipeline? I've seen some breadboards around with some really interesting looking yes. things. Um, is there anything you can tell yeah, us about what's working, coming up? We, you know, we love fuzz, so 
We're working on fuzz. My 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 boys from Texas, they love their fuzz. They love their octave fuzzes. They like oh, the fuzzes yeah. that sound like your amp is is falling apart. So we're working on some octave fuzzes. Um, also, we're going to try to expand our tone bender lineup. Right now we have the 1.5 and the Mark IV. Mm -hmm. um, we're working on a Mark I now. And I think it's great because it's, it's nastier, it's gnarlier um, sounding. You can just hit a string and it's just just enjoy that note. Um, so we've got a good version of that we're working on. Um, and, and I've got a few new employees now, so we're able to, to get more pedals out mm. and uh, get some new pedals out. Awesome, awesome. So from Bethel, Connecticut, uh, at the Analog Man uh, Cavern of Dreams and Hopes and Glory. Uh, yeah, we're gonna wrap up. Thank you so much again. It's been absolutely yeah. amazing. Um, so yeah. Goodbye from me, goodbye from Mick who's been on the camera, and uh, we'll see you soon. <laughs> Cheers guys, bye. Yeah.